translated by Constance Garnett. Book two, chapter twenty four. When Vronsky looked at his watch on the Karenin's balcony, he was so greatly agitated and lost in his thoughts that he saw the figures on the watch's face, but could not take in what time it was. He came out onto the high road and walked, picking his way carefully through the mud, to his carriage. He was so completely absorbed in his feeling for Anna that he did not even think what o'clock it was, and whether he had time to go to Briansky's. He had left him, as often happens, only the external faculty of memory that points out each step one has to take, one after the other. He went up to his coachman, who was dozing on the box, in the shadow, already lengthening, of a thick lime-tree. He admired the shifting clouds of midges circling over the hot horses, and waking the coachman, he jumped into the carriage, and told him to drive to Briansky's. It was only after driving nearly five miles that he had sufficiently recovered himself to look at his watch, and realize that it was half-past five, and he was late. There were several races fixed for that day, the mounted guards race, then the officers' mile-and-a-half race, then the three-mile race, and then the race for which he was entered. He could still be in time for his race, but if he went to Briansky's he could only just be in time, and he would arrive when the whole of the court would be in their places. That would be a pity. But he had promised Briansky to come, and so he decided to drive on, telling the coachman not to spare the horses. He reached Briansky's, spent five minutes there, and galloped back. This rapid drive calmed him. All that was painful in his relations with Anna, all the feeling of indefiniteness left by their conversation, had slipped out of his mind. He was thinking now, with pleasure and excitement, of the race, of his being, anyhow, in time. And now and then the thought of the blissful interview awaiting him that night flashed across his imagination like a flaming light. The excitement of the approaching race gained upon him as he drove further and further into the atmosphere of the races, overtaking carriages driving up from the summer villas or out of Petersburg. At his quarters no one was left at home. All were at the races, and his valet was looking out for him at the gate. While he was changing his clothes, his valet told him that the second race had begun already, that a lot of gentlemen had been to ask for him, and a boy had twice run up from the stables. Dressing without hurry, he never hurried himself, and never lost his self-possession, Vronsky drove to the sheds. From the sheds he could see a perfect sea of carriages, and people on foot, soldiers surrounding the race course, and pavilions swarming with people. The second race was apparently going on, for just as he went into the sheds he heard a bell ringing. Going towards the stable he met the white-legged chestnut, Mahotin's gladiator, being led to the race course in a blue forage horse cloth, with what looked like huge ears edged with blue. "'Where's Cord?' he asked the stable boy. "'In the stable, putting on the saddle.' In the open horse-box stood Frou-Frou, saddled ready. They were just going to lead her out. "'I'm not too late?' "'All right, all right,' said the Englishman. "'Don't upset yourself.' Vronsky once more took in, in one glance, the exquisite lines of his favorite mare, who was quivering all over, and with an effort he tore himself from the sight of her and went out of the stable." He went towards the pavilions at the most favorable moment for escaping attention. The mile-and-a-half race was just finishing, and all eyes were fixed on the horse-guard in front and the light hussar behind, urging their horses on with a last effort close to the winning post. From the center and outside of the ring all were crowding to the winning post, and a group of soldiers and officers of the horse guards were shouting loudly their delight at the expected triumph of their officer and comrade. Vronsky moved into the middle of the crowd unnoticed, almost at the very moment when the bell rang at the finish of the race, and the tall, mud-spattered horse guard who came in first, bending over the saddle, let go the reins of his panting gray horse that looked dark with sweat. 
The horse, stiffening out its legs, with an effort stopped its rapid course, and the officer of the horse guards looked round him like a man waking up from a heavy sleep, and just managed to smile. A crowd of friends and outsiders pressed round him. Vronsky intentionally avoided that select crowd of the upper world, which was moving and talking with discreet freedom before the pavilions. He knew that Madame Karenina was there, and Betsy, and his brother's wife, and he purposely did not go near them for fear of something distracting his attention. But he was continually met and stopped by acquaintances, who told him about the previous races, and kept asking him why he was so late. At the time when the racers had to go to the pavilion to receive the prizes, and all attention was directed to that point, Vronsky's elder brother, Alexander, a colonel with heavy fringed epaulets, came up to him. He was not tall, though as broadly built as Alexei, and handsomer and rosier than he. He had a red nose and an open, drunken-looking face. "'Did you get my note?' he said. "'There's never any finding you.' Alexander Vronsky, in spite of the dissolute life, and in especial the drunken habits, for which he was notorious, was quite one of the court circle. Now, as he talked to his brother of a matter bound to be exceedingly disagreeable to him, knowing that the eyes of many people might be fixed upon him, he kept a smiling countenance, as though he were jesting with his brother about something of little moment. I got it, and I really can't make out what you are worrying yourself about, said Alexei. I'm worrying myself because the remark has just been made to me that you weren't here, and that you were seen in Peterhof on Monday. There are matters which only concern those directly interested in them, and the matter you are so worried about is, yes, but if so, you may as well cut the service. I beg you not to meddle, and that's all I have to say. Alexei Vronsky's frowning face turned white, and his prominent lower jaw quivered, which happened rarely with him. Being a man of very warm heart, he was seldom angry, but when he was angry, and when his chin quivered, then, as Alexander Vronsky knew, he was dangerous. Alexander Vronsky smiled gaily. I only wanted to give you mother's letter. Answer it, and don't worry about anything just before the race. Bon chance, he added, smiling, and he moved away from him. But after him, another friendly greeting brought Vronsky to a standstill. So you won't recognize your friends. How are you, mon cher? said Stepan Arkadyevitch, as conspicuously brilliant in the midst of all the Petersburg brilliance as he was in Moscow his face rosy and his whiskers sleek and glossy. I came up yesterday, and I'm delighted that I shall see your triumph. When shall we meet? Come tomorrow to the mess-room, said Vronsky, and squeezing him by the sleeve of his coat, with apologies, he moved away to the center of the race-course, where the horses were being led for the great steeplechase. The horses who had run in the last race were being led home, steaming and exhausted, by the stable-boys, and one after another the fresh horses for the coming race made their appearance, for the most part English racers, wearing horse-cloths, and looking, with their drawn-up bellies, like strange, huge birds. On the right was led in Fru-Fru, lean and beautiful, lifting up her elastic, rather long pasterns, as though moved by springs. Not far from her they were taking the rug off the lop-eared gladiator. The strong, exquisite, perfectly correct lines of the stallion, with his superb hindquarters and excessively short pasterns almost over his hoofs, attracted Vronsky's attention in spite of himself. He would have gone up to his mare, but he was again detained by an acquaintance. "'Oh, there's Karenin,' said the acquaintance with whom he was chatting. He's looking for his wife, and she's in the middle of the pavilion. Didn't you see her? No, answered Vronsky, and without even glancing round towards the pavilion where his friend was pointing out Madame Karenina, he went up to his mare. Vronsky had not had time to look at the saddle, 
about which he had to give some direction, when the competitors were summoned to the pavilion to receive their numbers and places in the row at starting. Seventeen officers, looking serious and severe, many with pale faces, met together in the pavilion and drew the numbers. Vronsky drew the number seven. The cry was heard, Mount! Feeling that, with the others riding in the race, he was the center upon which all eyes were fastened, Vronsky walked up to his mare in that state of nervous tension in which he usually became deliberate and composed in his movements. Cord, in honor of the races, had put on his best clothes, a black coat buttoned up, a stiffly starched collar which propped up his cheeks, a round black hat, and top boots. He was calm and dignified as ever, and was, with his own hands, holding Frou-Frou by both reins, standing straight in front of her. Frou-Frou was still trembling, as though in a fever. Her eye, full of fire, glanced sideways at Vronsky. Vronsky slipped his finger under the saddle girth. The mare glanced aslant at him, drew up her lip, and twitched her ear. The Englishman puckered up his lips, intending to indicate a smile that any one should verify his saddling. "'Get up. You won't feel so excited.' Vronsky looked round for the last time at his rivals. He knew he would not see them during the race. Two were already riding forward to the point from which they were to start. Galtsin, a friend of Vronsky's, and one of his more formidable rivals, was moving round a bay horse that would not let him mount. A little light hussar in tight riding breeches rode off at a gallop, crouched up like a cat on the saddle, in imitation of English jockeys. Prince Kuzovlev sat with a white face on his thoroughbred mare from the Grabovsky stud, while an English groom led her by the bridle. Vronsky and all his comrades knew Kuzovlev and his peculiarity of weak nerves and terrible vanity. They knew that he was afraid of everything, afraid of riding a spirited horse. But now, just because it was terrible, because people broke their necks, and there was a doctor standing at each obstacle, and an ambulance with a cross on it, and a sister of mercy, he had made up his mind to take part in the race. Their eyes met, and Vronsky gave him a friendly and encouraging nod. Only one he did not see, his chief rival, Mahotin, on Gladiator. "'Don't be in a hurry,' said Cord to Vronsky. "'And remember one thing. Don't hold her in at the fences, and don't urge her own. Let her go as she likes.' "'All right, all right,' said Vronsky, taking the reins. "'If you can, lead the race, but don't lose heart till the last minute, even if you're behind.' Before the mare had time to move, Vronsky stepped with an agile, vigorous movement into the steel-toothed stirrup, and lightly and firmly seated himself on the creaking leather of the saddle. Getting his right foot in the stirrup, he smoothed the double reins, as he always did, between his fingers, and cord let go. As though she did not know which foot to put first, Frou-Frou started, dragging at the reins with her long neck, and as though she were on springs, shaking her rider from side to side. Cord quickened his step, following him. The excited mare, trying to shake off her rider, first on one side and then the other, pulled at the reins, and Vronsky tried in vain, with voice and hand, to soothe her. They were just reaching the dammed-up stream on their way to the starting point. Several of the riders were in front, and several behind, when suddenly Vronsky heard the sound of a horse galloping in the mud behind him, and he was overtaken by Mahotin on his white-legged, lop-eared gladiator. Mahotin smiled, showing his long teeth, but Vronsky looked angrily at him. He did not like him, and regarded him now as his most formidable rival. He was angry with him for galloping past and exciting his mare. Frou-Frou started into a gallop, her left foot forward, made two bounds, and fretting at the tightened reins, passed into a jolting trot, bumping her rider up and down. Cord, too, scowled, and followed Vronsky almost at a trot. End of chapter 24